Hi, my name is Brian Capo, and this is going to be a quick video about using Zoom to teach from home. Johns Hopkins has a site license for Zoom. It's a minimal license by default, which means that the maximum length of time of the Zoom meeting will be, will be 45 minutes, I believe. Uh, and the maximum number of participants, I believe, is 100. Uh, if you get the upgraded license, which I have, you'll see that the meeting capacity extends up to 300 and the length of time is extended to as long as you want. A uh, first thing to think about before you use Zoom is whether or not you actually need Zoom for doing what you'd like. If all you want to do is record a lecture and then send out the recorded lecture, then you do not need to use Zoom. Zoom is a web conferencing solution, so it's pretty much only going to be useful if you want to show the, um, the uh, record the class, but have the students participate in the recording of the class. Uh, or if you don't want to record the class at all, you just want a live version of the class uh, done via a web conferencing tool. That would be the only reason to use Zoom. If you want to record a lecture, then just use screencasting software or record another video showing how to use basic screencasting software. Okay, so let's suppose you're like that I am in my case, where I would like whoever, would, however many of my students that want to, to watch the recording of the class live, but then I also want to post a recording for them to watch later on. If you're in that boat, then Zoom is a pretty good solution. You log into Zoom, which is jh.zoom.us, uh, and that gives you to the Johns Hopkins uh, uh, enterprise version of Zoom. You click on host a meeting, you can choose to have it with a video on or off. I'm just going to choose, or you can do a screen share, but I'm going to choose it with a video off. And then here it comes up. And then the first thing that you want to check is whether or not your microphone is actually working. So if you look in the lower left-hand corner right here, there's a little green microphone, right? And uh, as I'm talking, it's going up and down. You can click, if you have a USB microphone, for example, you can click here and switch between your microphone. I found you often want to double check these things before you start um, because it may you may have plugged in a microphone and when you plugged in the microphone, Zoom may not be using the microphone that you want. In this case, I'm using the internal microphone so you can see how, you know, how it sounds. Um, you know, if you want a really good microphone, uh, you know, that, that'll improve audio quality, but in a minute I'll show you some other things that I think have a bigger effect on audio quality. The other thing that happens to me is sometimes my system gets confused if I plug in a USB microphone. It also wants to use the microphone as the speaker output. Now that is a problem with the computer, that's not a problem, but that's the computer itself doing that. So you need to go into your computer system to make sure that even though it's receiving audio in from the microphone, the audio out is going to your uh, whatever speakers you want. Obviously, this isn't a problem if your microphone also has speakers or some way for, for you to listen, but it, you might plug in a microphone and it might be the, transmitting the audio correctly, but you might not be hearing it. You need to just double check that with your system settings before you start. So a big aspect of audio quality is the background noise that happens with other people on the Zoom call. So first of all, you want to obviously turn off, you know, set your environment so that it is as low feedback as you as you possibly can get, um, you know. Uh, but then also um, what often happens for me is if I accidental to, accidentally leave the participants um, um, unmuted, then, for example, someone who's sitting in their chair rustling some papers, they get the microphone from Zoom as if they're contributing to the uh, conversation, but they're, they're actually just rustling some papers. It'll dramatically mess up the recording quality and the audio quality and also the audio that the other students are hearing, especially if you have a lot of people on the call. You know, someone might be sitting somewhere in a coffee shop and there's a lot of ambient noise and Zoom is switching to that person's ambient noise as if it's part of the conversation. So you can do that by clicking, you can avoid that by clicking on manage participants and clicking on mute all. And then there's a box here that says allow participants to unmute themselves. I leave that unchecked. So the way that I'm doing my classes is I'm not allowing the students to talk 
as if it's a web conference while I'm delivering the Zoom lecture. Instead, I ask them to enter into the chat dialog um, right here, right, the chat dialog, a message, then there will be a little, the, the, the screen share will come up as a little message and uh, then I'll answer the question that way, or they can raise their hand. There's a little collection of tools here for people to interact with you in a way that doesn't require audio. Now you can look at the participants up here right now. There's only one and you can, let me move this over to the side a little bit. You can unmute someone in this dialog box right here um, if they're allowing you to. It, and then at that point, they would be able to talk. So you could manage your class where someone, you know, raises their hand digitally. And then um, uh, uh, you can see, you know, here you can give little bits of feedback, a little clap, clapping and stuff like that. But, um, you know, someone either chats or raise their hand, raises, digitally raises their hand via this dialog box here. Then you unmute them. Then they give. Uh, you know, uh, their question or their contribution to the lecture, and then you remute them again. So at any rate, remember, you have to actively manage your participants in that way. Otherwise, your audio quality is going to be terrible if you have a large class. If you have a small class and you can run it like a web conference, then you might as well just run it like a normal web conference. But usually you should probably ask people or manually mute people um, just because uh, unless they're speaking, uh, just because that really helps with the audio quality. Uh, next to invite people, you click on invite. You can either just send them the URL. That'll just send them to the website, which will bring up the Zoom window. Uh, Zoom is nice. It doesn't require any installed software. They just click on the URL and then it's going to open up. Uh, that is going to use uh, VoIP for the audio. Um, so if someone happens to be in a low bandwidth situation, then what they might want to do is call in to the conference, to the uh, web conferencing. So you can do that by copying the invitation here. And instead of just sending them the URL to the Zoom link, this invitation will then include the web conferencing as well. Um, that's especially helpful if, you know, a student is, yeah, a student is listening in from home where they don't have a great internet connection. Oh. So um, in order to record your, oh, in order to share your desktop, you just simply click share here. And you can choose to either share your whole desktop or just an application. Um, so I just typically share my whole desktop and during class. When you do that, you know, you make sure papers you're reviewing, grants you're reviewing, emails that you have open, et cetera, all the other things that contain private information are hidden so that people can't look at them, um, especially if you're recording, obviously. Um, so anyway, just take care of that. If you want to really kind of really eliminate the possibility of, um, you know, uh, you know, having like sensitive student information in an email displayed while you're in class, uh, you could log into a guest account on your computer because Zoom only requires a browser. Then you just log into Zoom using your JHEAD ID from the guest account. And then you can make sure that you don't have uh, sensitive information being displayed while you're giving your lecture. OK, um, when you share your screen, uh, I'm not going to click on it because I'm already sharing my screen with the screencasting software I'm using right now. You can pick your desktop or an application. Um, and then what this will do is it'll bring up a little toolbar that will, you know, your screen will be mostly shown except a little green and red toolbar. Um, you, there's a little arrow that you can click to move that toolbar from the top to the bottom of the screen. And there's a little red part that you can click on it to stop sharing. OK, from the toolbar, you can do some operations like invite people, et cetera. But you might as well just do that from this window um, uh, before getting started. The last thing you want to be able to do is record. So um, you can click on record. I don't want to record right now because I'm already recording. I don't know what kind of weird thing will happen when I do that. Probably nothing. Let's try it. So now it's recording. OK, um, but I don't want to spend too much time doing this because it's um, I'm not I'm recording this with a different um, screencaster right now. So so when you're done recording, um, when you end the meeting, it will stop recording. Uh, Zoom will send you an email with a link to the video. But then I'll also show you an example of where, where it puts them. Um, but uh, this will often take quite some time. So if you give an hour lecture, that's a lot of video to encode. 
So uh, it will take a little bit, you know, 20 or 30 minutes or more for Zoom to actually convert the video uh, into a, for a watchable format. 